There is also a second motivating question here, and that is related to is identity politics there? If you look at the uh, commentaries, political commentar political commentaries, political observations uh, on the media, we have the assumption, we have the impression that in order to be a good voter, someone must be rational in the sense that they have to discard the importance of religious or ethnic affiliations or other primordial identities. The assumption, the assumption here is that democracy requires voters to be rational, but that's not that's not the case in Indonesia and that's not the case in any other countries in the world. Here I have some example. For example, uh, when it comes to European integration, the EU actually national identity like Germans being proud of being Germans or uh, the UK. Yeah, or in the UK. Um, British people, some of them were proud to be uh, part of the UK and not part of the EU and it led to Brexit. So even in Europe, identity is still an influential factor. And in Britain, there is also a study that shows how uh, British voters actually are less likely to vote against minority ethnic minority candidates. If there is a Muslim candidate on the ballot, they are less likely to vote for the candidate. And that's, um, that's in the UK, much older democracy than Indonesia. And a recent article about the US politics show that one of the strongest predictors of support for Donald Trump is actually how people feel toward Muslim Americans. So regardless of what they perceive or what they think about the economy or about illegal immigrations, those who are resentful or those who have negative attitudes toward Muslim Americans are more likely to support um, Donald Trump. So these are just some examples of how identity still matters even in established democracies. And even if this, even if in these democracies identity still matters, then it's a fair question to also examine how identity also matters in the 2017 um, election. That's not to say that um, Indonesia is kind of Indonesia democracy is kind of backward because uh, because of the identity politics that the politicians employ. But rather, it is just something almost inevitable, and that's why we have to understand it. Because it's we have to understand it so that we can find um, some solution or find some strategies how to mitigate uh, identity politics in uh, our democracy. So just to, uh, the next couple of slides will provide some backgrounds about the religious and ethnic sentiments in the 2017 election. I will start with uh, the religious sentiment because that's what most people seem to think about um, was the most important factor that affected the Muslim voting behavior in the election. Let me give a brief overview of religious tolerance and intolerance in the country first. Religious tolerance, religious intolerance is always a um, hotly debated topic, a controversial topic in Indonesia. I hope you can see these charts. So these are from surveys by Lembaga Survey Indonesia. The picture on the left shows the, the percentage of respondents uh, when, it, when they were asked, do you object to non-Muslim becoming governor? We can see that about 52% of respondents in 2018, that's the uh, green line, green, green bar here, says that they object to non-Muslims becoming a governor. And you can see an increasing trend. An even higher percentage is evident when people were asked whether they would object to non-Muslims becoming president. About 60% in 2018 actually said that they would object to non-Muslims becoming president. So I have other charts like this that show there is indeed some reluctance on behalf of Indonesian Muslims when it comes to the idea of having a non-Muslim occupying a political leadership position. And we can also see the uh, number, the percentage uh, increase from 2016 to 2018 as well. And this resistance
sometimes this relevance was also evidence was also evident when it comes to um, the 2017 election. I'm sure many of us still remember the demonstrations that surrounded the elections, and these are just some examples of it. For example, the picture on the bottom left, it shows a man holding a pamphlet saying that Jakarta is a Muslim majority city, so we must reject a non-Muslim governor. So the idea is that because Jakarta is uh, majority Muslim, then the governor has to be Muslim as well. Or some also invoke even more explicit religious justification that it's haram or uh, forbidden for Muslims to be led by a non-Muslim or an infidel. But I would argue actually that these demonstrations were relatively unorganized until September 2016. And that's when the, until October 2016, and that's when uh, the blasphemy allegation against uh, Ahok <coughs> came to the uh, public attention. So just to remind us again what the blasphemy allegation was um, about. So, Ahok gave a public speech uh, in Kepulauan Seribu that advised the Muslim voters not to be fooled by people who use the Quran for political gains, but then um, Buniani uploaded a video of the speech accompanied by a transcription, an incorrect transcription, that um, says that, that portrays Ahok as if he was saying, don't want to be fooled by the Quran. So that's, uh, don't want to be fooled by people who use the Quran, and don't want to be fooled by, by the Quran, are two different things. But um, the video was successful in inciting protest and resistance against um, Ahok. And we have at least two large demonstrations in November the 4th and December the um, 2nd demanding Ahok not only to uh, retract his candidacy but also for him to be jailed. And we know that uh, blasphemy is indeed a punishable offense in Indonesia. So these demonstrations, this blasphemy accusation and the rhetoric delivered by politicians and religious elites they offer some justification about how religion was an important factor in the election. But there is the thing though. Focusing on religion actually belies Jakarta's and Indonesia's long history of anti-Chinese sentiment. And we can trace actually we can actually trace the sentiment back to the Dutch colonial era. Let me just give some examples. So Sarwak Satyadi um, from Singapore Management University and her team they did a survey of Indonesians, rep a representative national survey of Indonesians in 2017. So they asked the respondents whether they would be comfortable with a Chinese Indonesian in a position of political leadership. The figure on the left here breaks down the responses by education. You can see that regardless, the, regardless of the education level, the majority of the respondents, a significant majority, said that they would be uncomfortable. So that's the um, this kind of bar. It says it shows the percentage of respondents who are uncomfortable with the Chinese Indonesian in a position of political leadership. And the majority of the respondents say they would be uncomfortable with such a thing regardless of their education level. The same with the second figure on the right, uh, it breaks down the respondents by their income levels. Regardless of the respondents' income levels, the majority of them, a significant majority of them, said that they were uncomfortable with the Chinese Indonesia in a position of political leadership. So, one of the reasons why I'm showing these figures is that because it mirrors what I saw earlier when it comes to non-Muslim in a political leadership. So, not only that Indonesians are uncomfortable with the idea of a non-Muslim being a governor or a political leader, but they are also uncomfortable, uncomfortable with the idea of a Chinese Indonesian being in a position of political leadership. Of course, there is also another example of anti-Chinese sentiment in Indonesia, and perhaps one of the most tragic and darkest examples was what happened in May 1998 when uh, a couple of days prior to 
to help those resigning from power. We know that riots engulfed uh, Indonesia's big cities, including Jakarta, specifically targeting Chinese Indonesians and individuals of Chinese descent. In Jakarta alone, at least um, 150 Chinese Indonesian women were raped, and um, more than a thousand Chinese Indonesians were killed during riots, and thousands of businesses were looted, vandalized, or burned. And the figure on the right, right bottom right here shows Milik Pribumi. That's what the business owners at the time had to put or had to write on their business um, uh, front because that's their uh, free pass from the mob by saying that it belongs to Pribumi or belongs to local, belongs, belongs to non-Chinese. That's their free pass. That's uh, that's how they talk. That's how they tell the mob not to uh, vandalize the uh, their businesses. Closer to the election, we also find similar anti-Chinese sentiments. Um, exemplified, for example, by these two banners. The first one, it says, Ganyan uh, China, Penjalakan Ahok, or Crush the Chinese, Send Ahok to Jail. And the second one, on the right, it says, uh, Ahok is the source of our problems, uh, Crush the Chinese. Let me note that these banners were actually brought to the anti-Ahok, anti-blasphemy demonstrations. So, we know that these demonstrations were supposedly religiously motivated, but still we see we have these kind of banners brought to the demonstrations. What this tells us is that the same people who oppose Ahok because of his religious identity are also likely the ones who also oppose him because of his ethnic identity. And this underlines the importance of carefully disentangling the influence of religious and ethnic sentiments in examining how the Muslim voters voted in the 2017 election. So just to give a brief rundown of the significant events, September 27, in Kepulauan Seribu, Ahok met the allegedly blasphemous remark <coughs> that uh, brought him troubles and November 4th and December 2nd major demonstrations by Islamic groups protesting Ahok's uh, blasphemy statement and demanding him to be imprisoned February 14th, the first round of the election Ahok met uh, among the three candidates uh, with 42% of the votes and because Jakarta is the capital city of Indonesia it requires a majority of vote, not only a plurality so a runoff was held on April 19 again Ahok also won about 42% of the vote he was beaten by Anis Baswedan by about 16 percentage points and a couple weeks, three weeks after being defeated in the election uh, he was sentenced for two years in jail and in January this year, he was released from prison, from prison and asked to be called uh, BTP. And that's not that's not a, that's not a minor request because Ahok is his Chinese nickname given to him by his father. So it's it can be interpreted symbolically as his effort to distance himself from his ethnic identity in order to reach out to the broader Indonesian public. He might realize that um, there is a resistance of the Indonesian uh, public against a um, powerful, politically powerful ethnic uh, Chinese individual. And because of this request, in the remainder of the presentation, I will also have uh, use. First, some of them use open-ended questions. So, they asked the respondents, they did surveys, and they asked the respondents, please list the factors that are important uh, that you consider when deciding who to vote for. So in Indonesia, they would like, um, sebutkan faktor-faktor yang, yang uh, anda pertimbangkan ketika membentukkan pilihan dalam uh, pemilihan gubernur nanti. And then what they did was they calculate how many mentioned religion or ethnicity. So that's uh, pretty basic. And the second uh, approach is instead of asking the respondents to 
list the reasons that they think affect their vote choice. The researchers already have a list of factors and they ask the respondents uh, whether they consider each of these factors important when deciding whom to vote for. And then again, the researchers did uh, was calculating how many choose religious similarities or ethnic similarities. And the third approach is a direct question. Um, some studies, some surveys simply ask the respondents, do you consider religious similarities or do you consider ethnic similarities when deciding whom to vote for? Yes or no, and then calculate how many said yes. These are, these are good approaches, but there are limitations for these approaches. The first is that what we know from literature on political behavior is that a lot of people sometimes just don't, just are not aware why they are doing what they do, why they are voting for their candidate. So when you ask, when we ask someone, why did you vote for this candidate? It's most likely that they began to think about the reason the moment you ask them about their reason. So they already have their vote choice, and when you ask them, they offer some justification on the spot. So that's what we know from the literature on political behavior. So asking respondents what factors do you consider when deciding uh, whom to vote for, might not be tapping into the actual reasons that the that save the respondents uh, for choice. And the second is there is also social desirability. If I say that I will not vote, I will not vote for someone because that person is a Chinese or that person is uh, has a different skin color than I do, it would look it would make me look like a racist and people just don't want to look uh, racist or want to look intolerant. And there is a good um, study about it in the US politics, for example. If you, in 2016, if you ask people whether they would vote for Trump, you get a certain, asking them face to face, uh, or using a uh, phone, if you ask them, if you call them and ask them whether you would vote for Trump, for Trump, you get a certain uh, number of people saying that they would vote for Trump. But then if you call them using a robo caller, there is a uh, an automatic voice caller, so not directly uh, interacting with a human with a human interviewer, you actually get people uh, more willing to admit that they would vote for um, Trump. Because people people just don't like uh, people just don't like to be perceived as racist or um, intolerant. So, what did I do to overcome these limitations and challenges? First, I reformulate the uh, research question that I have. So I have two questions now, two more specific questions. The first one is what I call a photo side question. Photo side question asks, how do voters' feelings toward ethnic Chinese and toward Christians affect their support for Basuki uh, Cahaya Purnama or BTP? And the candidate side, I ask, how do BTP's religious and ethnic backgrounds affect voters' support for him? So we have voters' characteristics, that is their feelings toward ethnic Chinese and their feelings toward Christians, and we also have candidate characteristics, that is uh, BTP's religious affiliation and BTP's ethnicity. And I also ran a survey, an original survey of about 1,000 Muslims in Jakarta. <laughs> so let's go with the first question first. How do voters' feelings toward Christians and ethnic Chinese shape their support for BTP? For the dependent variable, I asked the respondents, which candidate would you vote for in the election? So there were three candidates, and I need to compromise the vote choice. If the respondents said that they would vote for BTP, I assigned them a value of one. If they said they would vote for any of the other candidates, I gave them a value of zero. And then my independent variables is what political scientists call feeling thermometers. So I asked the respondents, do you like or do you dislike ethnic Chinese in Bahasa? 
Apakah Anda sangat tidak suka, tidak suka, suka, atau sangat suka dengan uh, keturunan Tiongkok? And then, I also ask a similar question. Do you like or do you dislike Christians? The responses range from sangat tidak suka to or very dislike, strongly dislike, to strongly like. And these two measures, filling thermometers toward Christians and toward and the Chinese, are actually very strongly correlated at point seven. This again tells us how ethnic feelings and how religious feelings are strongly related. So, if someone says that my vote is driven by religion because of this strong relationship, it can be as well uh, meaning that my vote is driven by my ethnic um, sentiment. So this again underlines the importance of carefully disentangling the influence of religious sentiments and ethnic sentiments. And I also have another like a set of control variables, gender, age, and I also ask respondents whether or not they are satisfied with BDP's performance as incumbent. <coughs> so what I, what I use is I use a logistic regression models. So don't worry about yeah, don't worry much about the technical details. Uh, I will be happy to show the technical details during the Q&A. But here is the results that I get. <coughs> Models, a basic model and a full model. Here, I'm showing results from the basic models. So the basic models predict the probability of voting for BTP given the value of feeling toward Christians, the figure at the top, and or feeling toward ethnic Chinese. So the basic models include only one feeling thermometer at the time. The x-axis is the feeling toward Christians or feeling toward ethnic Chinese and the y-axis is the probability of supporting or uh, voting for BTP. Okay, so let's look at feeling toward Christians first. <coughs> Moving from strongly disliking Christians, score of 1, <coughs> to strongly liking Christians, score of 5, is associated with about 40 points increase in the probability of supporting BTP. So, the more positive the respondents feeling toward Christians are, the more likely they are to support BTP. <coughs> Similarly, we see a similar trend when it comes to feeling toward ethnic Chinese, but the effect is even bigger. Moving from strongly disliking ethnic Chinese to strongly liking ethnic Chinese is associated with about 57 points increase in the probability of supporting BTP. So the more positive the respondents feeling toward ethnic Chinese is, the more likely they are to support BTP, which is not uh, surprising. So this is the first type of model, the basic model. The second type of model is what I call the full models. The full models include both filling thermometers. <coughs> so the figure at the top right here, it includes the control variables, the filling toward Christians, and the filling toward ethnic Chinese. So what we have here is that once we control or once we take into account respondents filling toward ethnic Chinese, res respondents filling toward ethnic uh, toward Christians is actually no longer important. So what this means is that it's actually toward ethnic Chinese is more important in shaping the respondents feelings or the, the respondents support for BTP. <coughs> On the other hand, even after taking into account the importance of respondents feelings toward Christians, their feeling toward ethnic Chinese still shape their support for BTP. <coughs> So this is the first evidence for the primacy of ethnic sentiment. What Jakartans feel about ethnic Chinese actually matter more than how they feel about Christians in shaping their support for BTP. So that's the photo side question. The second question is the candidate side question. How do BTP's ethnicity and 
religious characteristics, shape voter support for him. So here, I employed an experimental design. <coughs> Here's what I did. I divided respondents into five groups. A control group, an ethnicity group, a religion group, an ethnicity religion group, and a religion and ulama group. So respondents were randomly assigned to one of these groups. And each of these groups subsequently received a different treatment. In the control group, respondents in the control group, <coughs> they were read a statement that says, Ahok is one of the candidates running in the Jakarta election. Will you vote for Ahok as governor of Jakarta? In the ethnicity group, they were read the same statement with one exception. Ahok is one of the candidates running in the Jakarta election in February. But then they were also reminded that, as you know, Ahok is of Chinese descent. Or <coughs> in Bahasa, seperti kita tahu, Ahok keturunan Tiongkok. Will you vote for Ahok as governor of Jakarta? Similarly, religion group, they were read the same statement, but now they are reminded that, as we know, Ahok is a Christian. The ethnicity and religion group, they were read the same statement, but now they were reminded that, as we know, Ahok is of Chinese descent and Christian. The ulama group was designed to amplify the effect of religious identity or religious sentiment. Respondents were reminded that, as we know, Ahok is Christian and several ulama prohibit voting for non-Muslim leaders. In Bahasa, seperti kita tahu, Ahok uh, beragama Kristen dan beberapa ulama mengharamkan memilih pemimpin non-Muslim. <coughs> Will you vote for Ahok as governor of Jakarta? So, <coughs> what these different texts do is that they remind the respondents, they make salient in the minds of the respondents particular characteristics of BTP at the moment. And we can examine how this how this priming, how this reminding respondents actually affected their, their support for BTP. So here's the result that I got. Respondents in control group, about 30% of them said they would vote for BTP. There is no difference between respondents in the control group and respondents in the religion group. So this is not a statistically significant difference. In other words, reminding respondents that Ahok, that BTP is Christian, did not decrease their support for him. But we can, also we can also compare the control and the ethnicity group. The ethnicity group reminds respondents that BTP is of Chinese descent. And we can actually see that this difference is statistically significant. Reminding respondents that BTP is of Chinese descent actually decreased their support by about 10 percentage points. We can also compare, we can also examine the effect of ethnic priming by comparing these two groups, the religion and the ethnicity and religion group. This difference is also statistically significant and this is how we should interpret it. Even among respondents who are already reminded that BTP is Christian, reminding them that BTP is of Chinese descent, decreased their support by about 12 percentage points. So even if respondents are, are already aware that, that BTP is Christian, reminding them that BTP is ethnic Chinese still decreased their support for him. So this again serves as evidence for the primacy of ethnic sentiment. So for the conclusions of these two studies is that ethnic considerations actually drive voters' choices more than religious considerations. On the voter side, we see <coughs> that respondents' feelings toward ethnic Chinese actually shape their support for BTP more than their feelings toward Christians. And on the candidate side, we find that reminding respondents that BTP is of Chinese descent, that Ahok keturunan Tionghoa, 
actually decrease their support for him, but we find no effect of reminding, reminding them that BTP is Christian. So, in the remainder of the presentations, I will discuss three remaining issues. First, why only minimal effects of religion, and the policy implications and the theoretical implications. <coughs> Why define only minimal effects of religion? <coughs> the, the simplest explanation, and also perhaps the most controversial, is that religion was mostly used as a cover for racism in 2017. As I said earlier, if I said that I will not, I will not fall for him or for the candidate because that candidate has a different has a different skin color than I do. That would make me look like a racist. But if I said I will not vote for him or for a candidate because my faith does not allow me to vote for him, in a religious society like Indonesia, that would be a more acceptable and justifiable excuse. So it is possible, considering how strongly related religious and ethnic sentiments are related in Indonesia, that the religious rhetoric coloring the 2017 election was mostly about covering racist attitudes or negative attitudes toward ethnic Chinese. <coughs> and the second possibility is that Yes, there are conservative narratives about how Muslims should not vote for non-Muslims, but there are also counter-narratives to this narrative. Uh, moderate Muslim organizations, moderate Muslim figures argue just for the opposite, that it's okay for Muslims to vote for a non-Muslim candidate. But on the other hand, we don't see this counter-narrative when it comes to ethnicity. There is a sentiment about how ethnic Chinese is possessing several negative traits or there are several negative stereotypes about anti Chinese but we don't see political elites standing up for Chinese Indonesians and say to the public that no, these stereotypes are incorrect um, they are citizens just like us and as a, as a result is that the public don't see counter narratives and the negative stereotypes, the negative stereotypes about ethnic Chinese didn't get uh, mitigated and or didn't get uh, debated in the public. <coughs> and the other possibility is that um, coming from psychology, what is called expectancy violation theory. The argument goes like this: um, ethnic Chinese public officials are relatively rare in Indonesia. So what this means is that people are not familiar with ethnic Chinese public officials. So when they think of ethnic Chinese becoming a public official, what they would expect is that these individuals, these ethnic Chinese individuals would perform poorly. Why? Because that's what the, step, the stereotypes about ethnic Chinese are in Indonesia. That, um, the negative stereotypes say that they are they would be incapable public officials. So when 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 the Jakartan voters saw in BTP someone who was doing relatively well in office, BTP's performance in office actually shattered or violated the expectation that the voters had in the first place. So they expected that any case public official would perform poorly, but then what they got was a pretty successful ethnic Chinese public official. And according to this expectancy violation theory, what violated our expectation actually leave us a more memorable impression. And that's maybe one of the reasons why ethnicity matters more than religion. Religion didn't matter because non-Muslim public officials are pretty common in Jakarta and uh, Indonesia as a whole. And the last possibility is that maybe Indonesian politics is already very saturated with religion. If everyone tries to look religiously, if everyone tries to behave religiously, then ironically religion would be a poor predictor of political behavior because everyone would behave almost the same way. Um, which of these explanations would be the most would be the one most responsible uh, to expand the findings here? My data does not allow me to go into that bit, but I sincerely hope that uh, future studies would be utilize the same method, the same approach that 
carefully disentangles ethnic and religious sentiments to examine which of these mechanisms um, influence the um, voting behavior of the Muslim voters more. In terms of the policy implications, um, I categorize the potential, potential policy implications into two groups. The first group is the one that goes without saying, like law enforcement and inclusive theology, meaning um, the Ministry of Religious Affairs and Ministry, Minister of, uh, the Ministry of Education have to make efforts to promote inclusive theology, especially in um, religious schools. And law enforcement, the police has to be impartial. That's a pretty standard solution, but also the one hard, most difficult to implement, perhaps. In addition to these uh, solutions, I'm also thinking that potential policy solutions can include party separation. What it means is that one of the characteristics of the Indonesian party system is that all of the parties are actually pretty much the same. Uh, they don't take different policy positions. They don't. They don't different. They don't. Uh, they don't create different brands or different images for themselves. So what this means is that the aspirations or the agendas of minority groups are likely poorly channeled by these parties. What we can learn from more established democracies is that parties tap into different privileges in the society. Some, uh, some tap into the majority voters, some tap into the working class, some focus on the minority groups, and that does not happen yet in Indonesia. So one of the ways why we can why we can promote inclusiveness in Indonesia is to encourage parties to differentiate themselves to take stronger positions on minority issues and we have actually one party that uh, in the last election that did quite well uh, on that aspect so party separation could be one potential solution and education system oriented toward diversity is another uh, possibility the, the issue here is um, and it's also related to the contemporary debate on religious education in school, whether we should keep religious education or whether we should abolish religious education. I think the question is not whether we should keep or abolish religious education, but how to um, use religious education to instead promote inclusiveness instead of exclusiveness. And maybe one of the experiences about um, one of America, one of the US experience can also be a learning point for us on this aspect in that how they promote how, how they encourage schools to integrate in the 1960s. So some private schools they they cannot well the federal government cannot force private schools to integrate. So what they did was that uh, they they make a requirement for schools if if they want to be eligible for federal grant, then they have to integrate. But there is no there is no forcing them to integrate. So that's maybe something that we can do here as well. In that the government creates, let's say, a diversity grant. There is no requirement. There is no forcing schools to apply for these grants. But if they want to apply for these grants, then you have to uh, show that you are. Um, creating an inclusive school environment, creating an inclusive um, curriculum. And the third possibility is media mainstreaming of minority groups. What, it mean, what I mean is that, um, again, I'm drawing this from the US experience, how their attitudes toward minority groups, African Americans, including LGBTQ groups, are uh, becoming more positive. One of the drivers is that, the media portrays these groups as they are, not as they are stereotypically portrayed. So in Indonesia, the stereotypes about ethnic Chinese, according to the survey by uh, Salut Setiadi, is that um, they care more about the economic and they don't really care about um, socializing. What the media can do, at least, is that to shatter these kind of stereotypes and just portray ethnic Chinese or other minority groups as just as any other citizens instead of um, reinforcing these um, stereotypes. And that's what I mean with media mainstreaming of minority groups. 
just basically showing the Indonesian public that minority groups are also as human error as other citizens are. And the last one for the theoretical implication. Um, I would like to describe the theoretical implication by citing um, by using a case by, from Sherlock Holmes. If you are familiar with it, uh, the adventure of Silver Blaze. Um, oh, sorry. The adventure of Silver Blaze. Uh, so, a race horse was stolen, and Sherlock Holmes was uh, invited by Inspector Gregory of the Scotland, Scotland Yard to investigate the disappearance of the horse. So upon some observations, um, Inspector Gregory asked Sherlock Holmes, so what can you tell me about what you have observed so far about the case? And Holmes said, um, I, would like to your, I would like to draw your attention to the curious incident of the dog in the night time. And Inspector Gregory said, uh, well, but the dog did nothing. Uh, it didn't bark, it didn't do anything. And Holmes said that, well, yeah, that's the curious incident. Uh, why didn't the dog bark? And I also want to make a parallel of this case to what happened in the 2017 election. We know that there is ethnic sentiment, there is religious sentiment in the election. But why did all of the but why was all of the rhetoric, most of the rhetoric was targeting BTP's religious affiliation? BTP is double minority. He's an ethnic Chinese and he's a Christian. But why did his opponents, why did his why did the politicians, the religious elites at the time prefer or choose to target his religious affiliation? I think that's our case of the dog that didn't bark. I argue it points to the necessity of differentiating between elite behavior and mass behavior. The elite behavior, it's easier for them to target BTP's religious affiliation because religious identity is a privileged class in Indonesia. The state recognizes only six religions and it affords these religions a degree of protection from criticisms. You cannot criticize religions in Indonesia or someone will file, could file a blasphemy charge against you. So, <laughs> in that sense, BTP's religious affiliation serves as an easier target. It also offers a degree of deniability, as I said earlier, if I if I said that I will not vote for someone because that person is, a diff is of different race than I am, then that would make me look like a racist. But if I said that no, I cannot vote for him or her because my religion does not allow me to do that thing, um, people might even think that I am a religious person. So that religion offers a degree of deniability for the elites that um, went against uh, BTP at the election. For the masses, the, the rationale was different. Both religious and ethnic sentiments were powerful and salient in Indonesian society. But what differentiates ethnic sentiments from religious sentiments was that there was not much disagreement in the public about ethnic stereotypes. As I mentioned earlier, when it comes to whether or not Muslims should be allowed to vote for non-Muslims, there were disagreements, there were debates between various Muslim organizations, so the public could actually see this disagreement. But no one actually debated whether there were indeed negative stereotypes about ethnic Chinese, whether ethnic Chinese could be a competent political leader, this kind of debate was largely absent in the election and in Indonesian politics in general. And what this means is that the public, the people at the grassroots, didn't see much disagreement about, about the elites. And if you don't see much disagreement about, about certain things that are salient in the society, then 
what you will get is a common uh, fallacy, meaning that you will think that people agree with you, that people agree with these stereotypes. And maybe that's the reason why I find that the mass behavior of these respondents were actually driven more by ethnic sentiments more than religious sentiments. Um, I sincerely hope that this project is not an end in itself, but the beginning of uh, something bigger. And I hope that um, other Indonesian scholars will make this, this, this distinction as well between health behavior and mass behavior, and not simply uh, interpret what elites say or what elites do as uh, the motivation or the factor that shapes uh, mass behavior. And with that in mind, I uh, thank you again for your time and attention and for what your comments are or questions. Indonesian politics, 
That is what the Islamic parties did in Indonesia. Some scholars they think that Indonesia like that religion is not an important factor in Indonesia because no Islamic parties ever ever won the election. That's that's a pretty standard argument in Indonesian politics. Well, look, uh, Indonesia is a secular democracy because uh, secular parties win the election and no Islamic parties ever won the election. But there is another perspective to that. One of the reasons why Islamic parties never won the election is because the secular parties already championed the issues that the Islamic parties did. And if you look at the work by Michael Buckler, for example, it is the nationalist parties, it is the supposedly secular parties that advocated Sharia bylaws in different provinces in Indonesia. So if the nationalist parties themselves took the issues of Sharia bylaws from the Islamic parties, then the Islamic parties would lose, its, would lose their uniqueness. And that's what I call you are advocating an issue by encouraging the, major, the, the more major parties by um, embracing your position. There is a possibility that PSI might be able um, to do that in the near future to the extent that they have the same exposure that they got in 2019. They might not be able to become a major party, but you don't have to be a major party in order to advocate an issue. In order, as long as you can convince the major parties that you are a credible threat and the issue that you advocate can give, can bring a lot of votes, that's that's one way, that's one potential way where you can uh, make your advocacy. That that would be my that would be my guess about uh, their political fate in the future. Okay, uh, good morning, Ms. Matt. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a long way from the wall. Okay, uh, I miss uh, uh, most parts of your presentation. That I can uh, get your main idea that you uh, argue that uh, religious and ethnic uh, sensitive Yeah, that is a Chinese is quite easier than between 
them on a technical stage. But together, uh, whether or not voters uh, did the same behavior, because you know, research about behavior, uh, then they did give us a talk. Or for that matter, in the first round of election, which I don't know how I won, in the first round of election, she considered a kind of lies. And actually, uh, and this is just uh, a skeptical part of me, <coughs> I agree with the whole notion that there's some people who are racist or against the Chinese and blah blah blah, and I'm not just people who believe in this country, but what about the personality of the thing? Uh, because I tend to believe that if some other figures, non Muslim, non Rumi, that's not even a word, I guess, uh, Chinese born, let's say that. Run for office and they have a different uh, like personality than Ahab does, especially that showed in public, you know, is angry all the time and all that. I think they would win, uh, and they just be you know, I don't know, but never so. My question is what about the personality that she also considered about that, uh, beside, uh, you know, uh, the whole religious and religious thing. And one last thing. Uh, did you also consider about uh, the timeline? Because I think before the whole Almeida uh, gap, uh, I think Al was fine. Like he was pretty well about considerably uh, uh, about other things. But after the Almeida gap, you know, like when down, completely like even some of my friends who were uh, the supporters of him suddenly began. No, I don't know about him because he showed some sort of. Uh, you know, hatred to toward uh, his father about that. And again, like, the whole personality thing, uh, it was a matter of thought about that. Thank you. Um, first question first about the data. So, the survey was created between Axi Bela Islam 1 dan Axi Bela Islam 2. So, it was in late November, the, the last two weeks of November. So, between November, I don't, I don't remember the exact dates, but it was in the last the last two weeks of November, so between the uh, demonstration on November 4th and the demonstration on December uh, the 2nd. Um, the survey was, um, so actually uh, worked with uh, some students from uh, psychology um, for volunteers. So yeah, randomized, pretty standard thing, um, randomized the Kelurahan, from the Kelurahan get the uh, get the list of RT and going to RT um, pretty standard like that it's, I also um, have a paper and I saw that the sample characteristics of the characteristics of the sample are pretty much uh, close to the characteristics of the uh, Jakarta population but here is the thing though what I would what I would argue explains the difference between my results and most other studies is that I'm not actually surprised but this result was to be honest also surprised me at the time because I also expected religious affiliation, sorry religious identity to matter more because that's what everyone seemed to say at the time but then first my approach is different um, the experiment what it does is that um, so if you're not very familiar with experimental design it's uh, by randomly signing people, you basically uh, make them similar in all aspects except the yeah. By random by randomizing people, what you did was that you make them similar on all aspects other than uh, as you know uh, other than this uh, red text. So I'm not. I'm not aware of any other studies that use the same design. I know that a lot of studies, especially us, the respondents, are the sources interviewing them, whether they would, whether they, why they would not vote for Ahok. And people would say because of the religious teaching, um, because of the um, religious mobilization. But again, I would say that such an approach has the has to address the possibility of respondents providing an on the spot justification because because that's that's what I'm not I don't want to sound so cynical skeptical about ordinary voters.
waters but actually having actually being able to discuss this kind of things being able to study politics being, being able to uh, do research is actually a privilege a lot of people most people actually don't have the time to think about politics as much as political scientists or any social scientists like to think about politics so what that means is that just because we ask them <coughs> uh, certain things and they answer one thing it doesn't mean that that's the reason why they are doing uh, what they are uh, doing but in the end of course that's an that's an empirical question and I would I would say that um, <coughs> it's it's just too bad that um, my study was the only one that did an experimental uh, design in the election. If there is another similar election in the future and we can do a similar experiment and we can uh, see uh, which one uh, would, would show uh, which show bigger effect on the scientific sentiment. So that's, I would I would say the methodology matters. The methodology matters a lot. Um, the more the more you rely on explicit rationals, explicit justifications by the respondents, the more the more you are susceptible to um, social desirability and uh, on the spot justification. <coughs> and for the question about personality of Ahok, yeah, he has, a, he has an interesting personality. <laughs> um, I don't know how much that I don't know how much that would matter. It's my answer is I don't know whether if he would be more polite, whether he would keep, whether <coughs> whether if he had stopped saying um, cursing words uh, that would actually have uh, helped him. I I don't know, um, but what I can say is that <coughs> we have this one Ahok <coughs> one BTP. And with this one BTP who is both Christian and ethnic Chinese, my study actually shows that it's his being ethnic Chinese that uh, drives the voters away more than his being uh, Christian. And in terms of the Almeida, <coughs> I also actually would like to point out that interpreting the Almeida effect was not actually really simple. There are at least three potential effects of Almeida and to the best of my knowledge no study ever like carefully this uh, carefully separating which of these effects actually um, happen in the election the first effect of Almeida is a the first possible effect of Almeida is a persuasion effect persuasion effect simply means that people who would not people who said they would vote for Ahok in the first place and knowing about the Almeida then they change their vote that's the first possibility the persuasion effect the second possibility is that a mobilization effect the mobilization effect is not about changing minds but that it about mobilizing people to vote especially people who think that Ahok was indeed blaspheming Islam so according to the mobilization uh, effect what the case blasphemy case about Ahok did the most was not that it changed his supporters to no longer support him but that it mobilized the people who were against him to turn out more to vote <coughs> and second, the third possibility is a demobilization effect demobilization effect is that instead of changing people who support Ahok to no longer support him or encouraging people who are against Ahok to vote more the mobilization effect is actually discouraging Ahok supporter to actually turn out to vote uh, in the election these three effects would have the same consequences in that Ahok's vote would be lower after the Almeida but which of which one of these three potential uh, effects actually drove the uh, actually led up to the uh, to his defeat in the election um, again I'm not sure my data does not allow me to make that um, in front but that's a that's a that's a valid question and a really good question <coughs> Thank you. 
supposed to what question she said, I don't know. Uh, but let me let me go to the first question first, like how how it might be related to the Indonesia China um, relations. I think what what matters for the voters is not the foreign policy, on, it's not on the foreign policy level in terms of the bilateral uh, relationship between Indonesia and China, but the perception that Chinese workers are coming to Indonesia to steal our jobs. Um, so that would that would be my guess uh, if anything affects how voters respond to Ahok's ethnic identity, it would be the perception that uh, the Chinese are coming to uh, take jobs away from Indonesia, which is, which is not very specific to Indonesia, which is not very idiosyncratic to Indonesia, because that's also what sen the same sentiment that we have when it comes to Brexit, like uh, the Brexiters think that people from the EU are coming to the UK and stealing their jobs, and also uh, in the in the US, uh, the same sentiment that immigrants, Hispanic immigrants, are coming uh, to steal jobs from white Americans. So it's, that would be my guess. On the on the policy level, it's Indonesia-China bilateral relationship might be important, but I think what matters more for the voters is more. Uh, is closer, clo closer to the heart uh, jobs, um, seeing people who don't like you, who don't, who don't look like you, uh, working on jobs that you think you can do. Uh, that's, that would be, uh, that would be my guess. And, and the second question about whether it will be different if the target is actually an ethnic minority but not a uh, religious minority, in this case, a Muslim, a Chinese Muslim, they will be, they will be really interesting. And I think my guess would be if if the candidate can play up his or her religious identity, and especially if the candidate is actually a convert, a convert to Muslim, they actually can be an asset. Uh, I would, there is a there is a famous preacher uh, who is of ethnic Chinese and also of comfort. Uh, he is a pretty popular. Uh, he is pretty popular and uh, he can he can play up that uh, juxtaposition, that that supposedly paradoxical identity of being ethnic Chinese and being Muslim. So for political candidates who who are ethnic Chinese and also Muslim, that yeah, my guess is that that could actually be uh, an asset. Yeah, but of course, I mean that's that's that's, that's just a guess um, because we also know that the negative sentiments about ethnic Chinese are pretty prevalent uh, in Indonesia. Um, so even though the fact that belongs to the majority religion, it's still possible that the opposition, the opponents, raise up the uh, sentiment more associating the candidate with the negative stereotypes, and um, it will end up with the candidate being difficult in the election. So that's, what I'm saying is that the likelihood of winning the election will be higher for an um, ethnic minority but religious minority candidate than a double minority candidate like uh, uh. Thank you for your presentation. Um,
kawan-kawan di uh, Respondent Set City, I ask them uh, that city and basically the results do not change as much whether you analyze them Japanese, Betaw so the, the four largest are Japanese, Betawi, and I forget the third one, but the fourth one is others uh, I should take a look uh, Yeah, but it doesn't matter uh, whether you analyze only Japanese respondents or Betawi respondents uh, as always uh, Ahok being Chinese that drive down their support for him and <coughs> the possibility of like actually disentangling and um, on on the real on the real life, real life level I'm not sure that's possible but at least on the Uh, empirical or uh, methodological level for a study, for a scientific study, it's uh, possible. <coughs> And what, what I mean with that though, um, as you said in the real life, it's uh, it's also, well, it's a, it's, well, you, you've mentioned the statistics about religious affiliations of uh, Chinese Indonesians. And that's that's a possible that's that's the first challenge to actually disentangle because I don't think that I don't think like I don't think that without some big external shock that kind of religious composition would change in the future and especially with uh, the anti-Chinese rhetoric that uh, some politicians. Tend to throw here and there, and the fact that these politicians are um, doing that, trying to appeal to the nativist um, sentiment and the uh, religious sentiment of the um, of certain voters, there is a hindrance of Chinese Indonesians moving. Uh, Or belonging or joining a religion that uh, I don't know might might look unfriendly uh, to them. That's yeah. Basically, I'm saying that uh, without the without the, without Chinese Indonesians being evenly spread out across all religions, then the, the, this entanglement will always be there, and you need a big external shock uh, for that to happen. And uh, when it comes to why it's possible to disentangle these aspects in the methodological um, aspect for a study, <coughs> and it's probably because um, in social science, like there are different ways where you can prime or make salient certain things and keep other things at the back of your mind, and at that point, at least when a certain thing is salient. That thing will be uh, disconnected from other things that is uh, that are connected uh, to it empirically. But then, how much that finding will travel to the real world, to the real world when it comes to uh, what's called uh, intersection intersectionality of religion and um, ethnicity. Uh, that's that's an open question, and okay, I don't I don't know the answer there. But it's a it's a good question. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Wendy. I'm from Sankawa and this is Swedish. Uh, my question about Ahab's case would be the legal process of it. But I think most of the last cases in Indonesia is mostly a political judge one and Ahab's case is uh, one of them. And the uh, case is able to proceed is, let's do not forget, is under the Huawei's administration. And it is with at the Attorney General's office is within his scope, his executive, uh, it is within the executive branch. And it is not unprecedented for the Attorney General to be used their mandate, to use their authority to stop an uh, ongoing process. There are um, cases of like this. And the rally is outside the was of the work, aluminum of the work, we demand everything, but actually the Attorney General office uh, could put a stop on a house case if they want. And have your opinion on this? Why the Attorney General uh, seems limited? They have their own um, authority to stop the house. It will be too 
all the because we let the group manager. Uh, in order, I would, I would actually connect that to my point about um, what I mean with parties uh, separation. In order to make, well, if the Attorney General withdrew or intervened in the case, some would say that it's a legal move, but some also would say it's a political move. And when when we do political move, we need political backing. I'm not sure that any of the parties, any of the major parties would back such a move because of their perception that such a move would upset or would could be used against them as uh, portraying them as being anti-Islam. And which is also, I mean, that's, that's also what we saw in the 2019 election, right? Why Jokowi picked the presidential candidate as the one he picked? Because that's how you could shield yourself from being portrayed as um, anti-Islam. So without party separation, without parties that actually dare and feel responsible to tap to the voices of those who are underrepresented, I don't expect any bold political move when it comes to blasphemy case or when it comes to religious interfaith relationships will happen in the uh, near future and I mean it's, it's pretty sad but it's a uh, 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 I would say it's a this is a sad uh, political uh, reality of course we can we can we can cross our fingers and expect like because Jokowi will not be able to run for the election then he can expand his all of his political capital in the second term to uh, to protect religious minorities and other minority groups. We can we can cross our fingers like that, but um, without not, without being pessimistic, I, that's 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 hard. Uh, that's hard to hard happen. I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to be pessimistic or to be dark here, but. Um, in, order, in order to do that, you need, you need parties, you need elites that will back you up uh, when, you, when you do the right thing of like, not using blasphemy cash to, to suppress uh, minority groups. You still, yeah, you still need political uh, backup in the parliament especially. Yeah, uh, with, oh no. Well, this this one in the paper, but 
PA decimeter, uh, whether or not people are satisfied with uh, PTP, <coughs> it still can be seen that drop down as well. 